Hello, folks. Good evening and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Nick. I help direct the events here at the Strand Bookstore. For a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor of that group of bookstores, still run by the Fast family, running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, we are excited to welcome back author and cartoonist Liana Fink for the launch of her newest book, Excuse Me. Liana is the author for, of Passing for Human and a regular contributor to The New Yorker. She is a, recipi a recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship and New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship and a Six Points Fellowship for Emerging Jewish Artists. She has had artist residencies in McDowell, Yaddo, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center, Headland Center for the Arts, and Willapa Bay Air. Joining Liana in conversation tonight is Sarah Glidden, a nonfiction cartoonist and illustrator living in Brooklyn. Her first graphic novel, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, which we also have, if any of you are interested after the event, was published by Vertigo Comics in 2010 and was featured in the Best American Comics series. Um, it is now published by Drawn and Quarterly, as is her New York Times bestselling second book, Rolling Blackouts. Her short comics articles have appeared in The Guardian, The Nib, Topic, and a variety of other publications. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Liana, Sarah, and excuse me, to The Strand. everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming out. I'm really excited to be talking to Liana tonight. Um, I'm a big fan of her work, and we've known each other for a while now. And I think you're going to start with a reading, right, mm -hmm. Liana? Yeah, I'm going to... Hi. I'm going to look over your head and read. Read while I read. Is this tone of voice okay for you all? Um, so we're reading from... I am reading from this. It's called Excuse Me. It's cartoons that were originally published on my Instagram feed. And I reworked them a little bit for this book. And I organized them in, into various categories. So very lazily, I'm just reading to you from the first category, which is love and dating. Uh, how to find romance. Put yourself in hundreds of dangerous and humiliating situations. Don't let yourself be destroyed or broken. Never give up. Forget, forget, forget. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Pretend not to notice the unfairness. Otherwise, what are we living for? <laughs> Trust me, I'm an algorithm. <laughs> amount of love I need, amount of love I can take. The two people who get it, you, A, you, B, a guy you only know through the internet. <laughs> Waiting patiently for my meek prince. And then this one needs some explaining. <laughs> He's also waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Being single but open. Now I just wait. <laughs> oh. Got feisty. These these alarms do not misfire. This is about um, the psychological phenomenon of feeling your feelings in your body. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about my body language. I don't mean anything by it. Uh, me 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 me, and then he gets bored, and like maybe I don't know. He's thinking about eating something. And then, <laughs> he doesn't love me anymore. Part one, do I like you? Part two, do you like me? Part three, do you really? 
these are the stages of getting to know and date and be in a relationship with someone. The ultimatum, it's me or your confidence. You can't be 5'5", five five. I'm 5'5". Five five. <laughs> this is one of the rare ones that was actually said to me, like <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> Impossibly handsome, possibly handsome. <laughs> Maturity, save me, someone save me, oh my god. Oh wait, that's right, no one can save me. <laughs> She's wearing like a sweatsuit, <laughs> which is cool. There is nothing I want more than to spend the evening with you, except the one thing I'm going to do instead. <laughs> the five languages of what you, you, of what you can convince yourself is love. Texting you, sending a link, telling you he likes dogs, belonging to the same religion as you, having sad eyes. <laughs> if you don't want to see me again, please say so. No, no, I insist on ghosting you. <laughs> I'm not going to do the dramatic reading of this. Engagement, engagement party, bachelorette party, bridal shower, wedding, honeymoon, pregnant, baby shower, baby, the end. <laughs> Sorry. What are you into sex? This was also said to me literally. <laughs> what are you into sexually? Emotions? No, sexually. <laughs> oh, I cut this one up. Portraits of his ex. First, a person. Then, a beautiful siren with whom you can never compete. Then, someone who used to date someone you used to date. I love your haircut, asterisk. I will learn to love your haircut. <laughs> Liars, I love you. I love you too, asterisk. I want to sleep with someone, double asterisk. I want someone to love me. <laughs> someone, the one. Uh, I'll explain. There's two possibilities, it's one man but two <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> a skeptic's guide to Tinder. If he looks kind, he might be very boring. <laughs> so this isn't a, like obvious. This is just based on my personal experiences. Like if the photo of someone looks really kind, he often is boring. <laughs> if he looks smart, he might be pretentious. If he looks sensitive, he might be unhinged. If he looks sweetly nerdy, he might be a pickup artist. <laughs> if he looks interesting, he might be immature, because he's like wearing his coolness on his sleeve. If he looks hot, he might be suburban. If you don't text within a few days of our first date, A, you're not interested in me, in which case you're too cold, in which case I don't let myself text you, or you've been busy with other people and or things, in which case you're too cavalier, in which case I don't let myself text you, or you want me to text first, in which case you're too passive, in which case I don't let myself text you. <laughs> And to be honest, I would text any of the, I used to text all of the above first. <laughs> Fears of dating. He is bad in ways you don't yet know. Once you know, it will be too late. Once you let your guard down, he will abandon you in an abrupt and brutal way. He will kill you. <laughs> there will be something that may or may not be a red flag. Without giving yourself permission to worry, you will worry. Thus divided from your true mind, you will lose yourself. Instead of working, you will secretly worry. You won't even know it. Your world will shrink. You'll become a nag. You won't be able to share your feelings anymore since your feelings belong to him. You will share your feelings despite the guilt. The guilt will kill you. He will be wonderful. Your, your, feels, your fears will dissipate. You will have lost your fears. And yeah, I think the fears are always there. You don't actually lose them. And the real fear is that you'll have the fears and pretend you don't have the fears. Me, 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 plus me, me, me equals us, us, us. 
five more? Did I really want to catch this? <laughs> I fit, I fit in your world. Uh, last one. The more generous you are, the more generous I am. The more generous I am, the less generous you are. The less generous you are, the less generous I am. The less generous I am, the more generous you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I guess I want to start with saying Thank you for putting out this book because you've been posting these for how many years now? I think about five years. Five years, and we finally get to pay you for it because you've been doing it for free for so long, and I'm always amazed at that, that you like, consistently post new work like day after day after day. Like, And did you ever get tired of doing this without, I don't know, having some way for people to give back to you? Um, no, but I don't think it's selfless. I think, I think, ha I think having a lot of people see your work is a kind of payment and I wish it weren't actual, actually like a real payment, but it kind of is like you have, like I feel popular in a way that I never have before and that's kind of creepy because <laughs> like I feel popular on this one ve online venue. So yeah, if there's payment, that's payment. The other really good thing besides the creepy thing is that I have really bad writer's block and I think when I'm being paid to do something and if I'm doing something for an official reason and it, it, it has to get past all these gatekeepers, I end up censoring myself a whole lot. And with these, I don't censor myself. So it's a way, it's kind of like my one outlet to not be shy and that's extremely valuable to me and I think if I started getting paid like I do get paid one for a magazine now and then will pay me to do Instagram f things for them and it's I feel very self-conscious doing those it's a very different feeling how does your approach to making cartoons for the New Yorker this not just a magazine, you can, you're can you allowed to say it, um, but how does your approach to making those cartoons differ from your approach to making these? Oh, it was other magazines, too. Oh, okay. I, get, I keep getting fired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> new scientist. Uh, uh, different because different audience. I think my audience finds me on Instagram. It's it's more female, it's more young. And the New Yorker, it's kind of a blanket thing. So I try to, it's as if I'm talking to a stranger at a party and I don't really know who they are yet and I'm kind of talking about the weather, but it's that, but with jokes, like I'm not gonna be like, oh, like nipples are so weird <laughs> to a stranger <laughs> or something. But um, <laughs> I'll be like, oh my God, aren't it the fact that people, interpret clouds, isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, how did you start making your Instagram cartoons? Like, I think, I had, didn't even know that you were posting them, and then I think somebody tagged me or something, and then I was like, oh my god, she's already been posting hundreds of these, and then I've been a follower ever since. Thank you. Um, yeah, I forgot, I forgot when I found out you followed me, or maybe I followed you first but it would have been a very nice day. Uh, I started doing the Instagram cartoons for, I'll give you the personal answer, why not? I was uh, weirdly obsessed with a man who was a kind of illustrator cartoonist and he posted drawings on Instagram and he was very shy and I got into Instagram because the only way he communicated with me was by liking my Instagram posts. <laughs> we never talked and <laughs> Out of respect for him, I never posted a drawing on Instagram. I didn't want to tread on his territory. But once he finally truly ghosted me, I thought there's no one I need to respect here anymore. And I started <laughs> posting drawings on Instagram and it was fun. And I still kind of a little bit feel like I'm channeling him and that is a little creepy, but I mean no disrespect. I think um, maybe it was a Long Reads podcast, but in one interview you said that you started posting out of anger 
Um, can you explain that a little bit? Was this before the Trump election or after? Yeah, it was before. It was five, about five years ago. And the anger was, yeah, I mean, the first cartoons I posted were full of pain at having been ghosted by this person I was weirdly obsessed with. Uh, and then that felt really good. It was the first time I'd had like a romantic heartbreak that I felt like I wasn't just spinning in circles. I was really sad. Like I like my legs kind of gave way, and I was like ha having trouble breathing. Like I was like being really dramatic, but um, dry drying out my feelings made them made me understand them. And once you understand a feeling, it it can't make you stop breathing anymore. Like it can't do odd, odd things to you. It's not that it disappears, but it's, a con it's more concrete and understandable. And, and I started doing that with all kinds of problems that I'd never put into words before, such as compulsive eating and um, being freaked out when, it, when people cut me in line and all these little things. And I still do, and it's very help it's helpful. I think it's changed my personality a lot. I was wondering, like, I wonder a lot about how, what your process is with making these, like, uh, for example, when some of them seem really specific, um, like someone cutting you in line or something, do you, in that moment, like, write it down, or do you kind of, like, store it away in your bank of things that you want to write about, and then later, when you sit down to work, it comes spilling out? If I'm, if I'm able to pull out my pad, I'll draw it right then and photograph it right then. And if I'm not, I'll email it to myself on my phone because they're very fleeting. If I forget them if I don't remember, if I don't make a way to remember them. So you don't do drafts for any of these? They're just nope. straight to paper? I'll do a draft if I have to draw something that's hard to draw, like a cat. <laughs> and the way I do drafts is I work on printer paper, so it's slightly translucent, and I could just lay one piece over the other and kind of see the, sh the shape. So I get to like do the details afresh, but I can see the shape of the cat underneath. And you actually, you redrew all of these cartoons for the book, Yeah, right? it was really hard. They're like <laughs> so detailed. Why did you decide to do that instead of just scanning the ones that you had? I didn't have any. I throw them out. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I draw them like in I draw them in the corners of my of other things I'm doing. So if I do archive them, it's like all over the place and and I don't know, it's just like often I'll like encroach on a, on one of the drawings and kind of like scribble if I already photographed it, I'll cross it out so I remember that I photographed it and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. It would have been a nightmare to, to look through all of it. I would have needed to like hire someone. <laughs> but you did have to look through, you said about five thousand, three or 5,000 comics. I think, yeah, comics. something like that. I looked through, but I looked through on Instagram, so they weren't, they were all in one place. They weren't like together with all the other garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been hard to separate which, like, to which ones of your babies to include? Yeah, and which not ones to even. Kill. They're not like babies. They're like, um, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> Just kidding. But they're like, li they're like thing. I guess they feel like things I've said at a party, and it's like having to look at all the things you've said <laughs> at parties and like decide which of them are monstrous and which are like nothing and which are actually witty. And that's like it was, made me feel so self-conscious and sick and yucky. Were there any that you were like, I don't want this one to be in there, but your editor decided like talked to you about maybe maybe we, let's include this one. It's actually really great. There, I don't remember, I don't feel that strongly, like if he, I'm very open to being, um, having my mind changed in, about my own work, so if he liked one, I probably immediately was like, oh yeah, you're right, that's great, but there were a few I pushed, actually, the, I think the whole animals chapter I would have liked to leave out, it's a little bit like, those were all rejected New Yorker cartoons, and I, <laughs> I don't know if the humor, Tra like is the same as the humor in the rest of the book. It's more kind of, I don't know, it seems kind of doofy. But, I, um, but I, I did like push him to let me put in some, some of the love and dating ones, like the, 
do I like you? Do you like me? Do you really? Like that's, I felt like I really figured something out there with the stages of my terror in a relationship of like before you are dating, like before the, bef like maybe on the first date, you're like, oh God, do I like this person? And then by the second date, your, your ego is at stake and you really want him to like you. And then, and then you're in a relationship and you're like barreling towards a mortgage or something and, <laughs> and it's scary and it's not like hunting anymore. But yeah, and I think he probably didn't get that because he's a guy, maybe it, it it's slightly different for him or something. Um, the very last comic, and it is a little guy saying, I don't get it. Um, and I think it's really funny that you Thanks. put that there because um, like, what's interesting about these in their Instagram home is that there's all these comments on it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people get upset when they don't get it. Like, like yeah. it's a joke. And if they don't laugh, then like you offended them somehow. And um, and you kind of get into it with some of them sometimes and like yeah. and fight back which i think is really a lot of us would never have the courage to do that Can um you raise your hand if i've ever been mean to you on instagram <laughs> they wouldn't I come scared them all off. <laughs> they're watching on youtube and they're going to comment on the youtube video <laughs> um, but where was i going with that i guess how do you feel about the comments and with interacting with people and like how is it different from like interacting with people in life that cut, cut you in line or say something offensive to you? It has taught me to interact a little more with people who cut me in line. I think the reason I interact so much on Instagram is like all this pent up need to, to be heard because I'm shy and I don't really, in, I historically haven't interacted in real life. Like, I don't think I learned that you're supposed to hold on to your place in line until my mid-20s. Like, I thought, oh, you're supposed to stand always at the back and make sure everyone gets in first. <laughs> and you're like the sheepdog, just like making sure everyone got their food. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a compulsion and I'm not proud of it, but I do it and I'm trying to learn, I'm learning slowly how to do it a little more funny and a little less like, like freaked out. Um, you post a lot and I don't know, whenever I post something on Instagram, which, which isn't as often, um, although I wish I did, like I feel like I have to like block myself from the looking back and seeing what people are saying or how many likes, like yeah. is that a problem for you or I do you kind of just never, enjoy it? Yeah, I can't not look. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like if someone says something mean, I need like I need to be mean back. <laughs> but it's okay if it doesn't get a lot of likes, that's okay. <laughs> it is something really different like reading this book without the likes or without seeing if someone I know <laughs> has already liked it first or commented first before I got to see it. Like, yeah, definitely not. It's really relaxing, like not having those other Instagram people there. Like it's <laughs> like I get you to myself and Thank like, you. I don't know, it was a really nice experience. What's going to be not relaxing is turning the pages. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's just not like swiping. <laughs> it's not the same. I have this like paperweight that goes inside the book that is supposed to keep the pages open. Oh. But then you have to lift it up every time you have to turn the page. <laughs> books. I mostly read comic books. So I'll, yeah, and if it's not a comic book, it like eats up a big chunk of the writing. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, I I was just look, flipping through and trying to find the comic, but there's a cartoon in here that has this, you know, your, your kind of persona, mm -hmm. and then a drawing that looks a little bit more like you when you had short, dark hair. Yeah. And I think you say, this is where we have to go our separate ways. Yeah. Um, can you talk about your persona? And do people ever ask you, like, why doesn't she look like you? Like, why do you draw yeah. yourself like that? I think when when I drew that, it was because an ex-boyfriend complained a lot that I was drawing autobiographical cartoons that sometimes t like were about him, and we got in a huge fight. And I wrote, I drew that one, feeling really sorry for myself, and then I promptly went back to drawing about him. <laughs> <laughs> but I draw myself with long hair because I. Like half the time I have long hair, I don't really relate as either a short or long haired person. And I think it's kind of, I always wanted 
I always had trouble with um, an every man figure. I feel like every cartoonist just has, or not, many cartoonists have a kind of every man figure, like XKCD, the best known cartoonist, has a stick figure, and um, Garfield has a cat, and <laughs> Kathy, well, Kathy is feminist, she has a lady, but um, it's, it's, so, it's much more, Saul Steinberg has a guy, and then it's just, it's rare to see, like, just a normal character who could be anyone who's not an, a white man of indeterminate age, I guess. So it took me a really long time to figure out how to draw just like a random person. And I think it's also hard because in this day, we know that there is no such thing as an everyman. And in drawing like this, this unshaded char character, like she's uh, she's a white woman. She kind of looks like a blonde woman. And like I guess I know she's not an everyman. And so I don't have the luxury that um, Saul Steinberg had in thinking he had created an everyman. Anyway, she is based on my dog, Sophie, who is a yellow lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good yeah. answer. <laughs> she has like floppy ears. She was blonde. <laughs> I love that. Um, so I know that sometimes you, well, I actually, OK, so I wanted to ask you about your day, your creative day, because you're often working on a book. You know, you just came out with a book last year, and you do ca cartoons for The New Yorker and like various other things. So how much time do you spend on these versus those other projects? And where do you, where do you like to work? I've never, I've never figured out how to do all the things well at once. So when, I don't, when I'm not working on a book very hard, my New Yorker cartoons tend to get better. And sometimes I phone them in or rework old cartoons, and I feel so bad about that. But my brain just, even if I allocate time, it doesn't, it doesn't switch back and forth very fast. Um, I work in the morning in cafes. and. Later on, ostensibly in my apartment, although like I don't like to travel a lot, so if I have a meeting somewhere, I don't want to go home, like cafe home meeting, and I'll often just camp out somewhere near the meeting. I like benches, uh, parks. Um, each day is different. When I'm working on a book, I like to be at home and totally quiet, and maybe a very boring podcast that I don't listen to. But when I'm doing cartoons, I like to be watching people and walking around. I usually do my, I, I take a day and I take a train to Long Island and I come up with cartoon ideas on the train and walking on the beach. And it's just, I don't know why, it's just, I think when you're sitting at a desk, it's too formal and, and the ideas don't really come. Yeah, being in motion often makes people get more ideas. So is it hard to draw on the train? No. You Even with like the ch -ch 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 -ch. You see my style. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It seems very detailed to me. Thank you. And like it would be ruined by that. So when you get out to, you go to Montauk yeah. a lot. Yeah, Montauk or one of the stops along the way. And you just take a walk on the beach and then come back? Yeah. <laughs> I prefer the stops that have a supermarket with a bathroom in it along the way. <laughs> but you don't go to a cafe in Montauk. No, but I do buy a salad in a supermarket. Okay. <laughs> I, I've been wanting to do something like that for a yeah. long time, but I was always afraid that maybe you would be on that train and then you'd, <laughs> you'd feel upset that I was like in your territory and then I'd end up in one of these cartoons. That's so kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> but you should go. The trains are really big. Yeah, it's true. I'll just keep walking. <laughs> I mean, I know that like... Do a lot of your like friends and family ever get nervous that they're the ones being portrayed in the cartoons and then they change your behavior around you because they don't want to upset you? I deliberately I don't really put my family in and I don't put my friends in usually either. I think when a friend, when I draw a friend, it's something that so many people have done that it's like not specific anymore. But I do think sometimes friends think they're about them. I really don't think they are. They are about... I do, like, since I only have one boyfriend at a time, they're usually <laughs> about him. <laughs> and I feel really bad about that. But it's also, like, 
I think for women, like romance is supposed to be the main thing in our life. And for better or for worse, it's the main thing in my life. And it's the thing I think about most. And to tell me that I'm not allowed to write about the thing I think about most or to talk about it, which I think is how, what we're subtly told, is just to like turn me into a non-person. Yeah. I know that like a lot of times, I mean, you're talking about very personal feelings or experiences, but I think what really grabs a lot of us and why we love them so much is that they feel so familiar to us as well. Um, and then a lot of people make comments like, oh, this is me. Like, does that make you feel when you, when you hear something like that, like your, your own self is less special than you thought or less unique? Or does it no. make you feel good that like, yeah. oh, we're all in this together and so it makes I. me feel really good because I I don't I was a weird kid maybe or a shy, something was going on I'm not sure what it was I didn't feel very relatable and if if I don't I've always drawn but I've always wondered if I drew my experiences maybe it'll be like an alien's experience and no one will get it and it's it's ama it's still really amazing to me when people do get my autobiographical stuff. Um, I didn't have time to have this added to your slideshow, um, and it's not in the relationship section anyway, but there's this one comic um, where there's a bunch of angels blessing a baby. Fairy, fairies. Fairies, I'm yeah. sorry. I wasn't reading closely enough. Um, and one says, I will give the baby excellent fine motor skills. The other says, I will give her an excellent memory. And the third one says, I will give her an associative mind. And the last one says, I will give her the ability to be fascinated by tiny things and lose herself in them. And then all of a sudden, the door blew open and the wicked, fa wicked fairy, who had not been invited, said, the baby will understand nothing about humans and how they interact with each other. And then the last good fairy, who had not yet bestowed her gifts, said, I will grant her the ability very slowly and painstakingly to learn. Um, I love that one so much. And I was wondering if drawing these comics is helping you to learn how humans are. Yeah, it is. Um, I wrote that one when I was researching neurodiversity. It's, I don't know, I don't know how I relate or whether I think of it as about me, but it does, it really, reading about different ways brains are wired differently really helps me kind of understand myself. And, and I don't, I don't know, I don't like to, I think actually after I, made that cartoon, I was given an award for autistic people, and that I felt like a fraud, and it was a really, it was a really great organization um, called Extreme Kids and Crew, which everyone should know about, but I felt like I was like, didn't, I don't, I don't think I felt like a person who should be given that award. I thought it should be given to someone who was more who was autistic and faced more challenges I don't know but mixed feelings I think but I think a lot of people have mixed feelings about this and kind of want to label themselves and don't and don't want to label themselves because at this point in time the labels are pretty like mean a lot and you can't be kind of a little bit of you can't be a little bit of something and say that you are the thing but Learning about it has helped me know myself a lot better. Yeah. Well, and you say that um, in another interview, you said that a lot of times people get upset in the comments because of something that you brought up. They call it a microaggression, and like she's overreacting, and you're talking about things that actually like bring you pain, and that you know you're trying to express something real about you know neurodiversity, like. Is it like, how do you keep yourself from like just spilling out like a like really straightforward explanation about that? Or it's not their business, so you just move on? I don't think there are words for a straightforward explanation. I think if there were, I would use them. I feel so fraudulent both saying, I'm on the spectrum because, eh. And I also feel fraudulent saying, I'm not on the spectrum because it's like, ew, why would I be on the spectrum that's gross or something? Neither of those, I don't feel either of those ways, really. And that's a lot to go into, and a lot of people feel differently about it. I think it's just, it's a point in, in science that is not, I don't think we know a lot yet, and I think the words don't describe most of us. 
Um, and yeah, the, when I write about little things on the street, those seem to be the ones that people relate to the least. I think a few, some people relate a lot, but many people don't relate. I find that people have very different, um, different capacities for being brushed past. Well, I think a lot of us, you know, have experienced the same things, but a lot of us just like push it down or just we try to just not ignore it um, when really like there is part of us that's really bothered and maybe um, I think well I had another cartoon that I couldn't find in the book just now but I wrote it down um, two things to make a thing worthwhile one step backward and find the humor in it and two step forward and find the meaning in it and I think that that's a lot of your work why I love it so much is because you, you, I don't know, somehow you do both. You find the humor, but you also step forward and you find the meaning in those little interactions that to a lot of us might just be like, oh, that person pushed me, they're rude. But like, there is meaning in that. Like, it means something about how we treat other people and how they treat us. And yeah. I don't know, that's not a question. I'm Thanks. sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I think of them as funny, which is also, I want them to be funny and I hope I get funnier. But I think, I, I think of myself as like a cartoonist who's not that funny, who's more more direct, but I'm starting to think that direct and funny are two members of the same family and they kind of fill the same place. I think so too. I mean, everyone was laughing just now, so that's proof. Yeah, were you guys You're uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> they look happy. Yeah. I don't know. And maybe this is a good time to open it up to questions from you guys. Um, does anyone have a question? There's a question in the back. Yeah. Oh, wait, the microphone's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I was, hey, hey. <laughs> I was wondering if you had like uh, a percentage, I guess, of the amount of stuff that you, like the content that you have, a percentage of how much is based off of like real life experience versus like what you draw from just your imagination. It's all, it all starts as real life experience, but ideally I, I um, try to find the universal in that and try to, I don't. I, n I would never write about like this is what happened at 10 a.m. today. I'll, if something happens at 10 a.m. and I say, oh, this is a pattern. This happens to me all the time. Then I'll I'll try to boil it down to that and write it, which makes me feel less guilty for writing about things that happen. They seem strangely impersonal to me. Anyone else? Is there like a straw that broke the camel's back for like, okay, now I'm going to write about this because it's happened so many times. Like, when do you notice that pattern, you know? I don't know. I think, yeah, I think like w one is always kind of focused on one thing at a time. So maybe I'll be very overwhelmed one, one week and I'll be very focused on what is this feeling? What is overwhelm? Let's try to solve it. And then the next week I'll, feel, um, I don't know, like heartbroken and I'll think what is heartbreak or what is ambivalence and, and so everything, everything in the given week kind of belongs to a pattern and like looking for examples. Yeah, I've noticed that, I mean, this book is uh, organized thematically, but if you look at the Instagram feed, it also kind of seems sometimes to be organized that way. You can tell when you're having a week that you're thinking about relationships more or when you're thinking about, you know, she's been to a lot of cafes this week or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can tell that. Yeah. How did you decide to, to do this thematically instead of chronologically? Um, it was my, my editor, Andy Ward's decision, and it was smart. I can't, yeah, speaking about stepping backwards, that's not really my strong suit, and it's very good to have a very um, hands-on editor. Yeah, I like those too. Yeah. And yes, uh, where is oh, the microphone? Sorry. Getting a lot of exercise. <laughs> Back here. Um, what's it been like going from um, just like um, single panel cartoons on Instagram um, to the long form ones on your Patreon now? Oh yeah, I wanted to ask about your Patreon too. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. I'm doing Patreon to force myself to do longer cartoons because I have a lot of, I think, 
I think the reason I could do short cartoons is submitting to the New Yorker. You have to draw 10 every week and bring them in every week and show them. And I think it just like, it was like a battering ram that made me stop being precious with it. But I've never had that with long form cartoons because book publishing is so slow. Like you can be precious for five years and overwork a graphic novel. And I'm just, on the Patreon, I'm forcing myself to put out like one, I'll, I'll do more soon, and I'm sorry, I've been really busy emailing for book <laughs> publicity, and I feel so guilty about it, but I'm planning to overload you guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just forcing myself to do a chunk, and it doesn't, I don't, it shouldn't matter if it's good, just like with the Instagram, I don't care if they're good or not, I just need to produce, and I really want to do, I want to feel that way about long form. I don't want to feel like, oh God, will I pass this test? And the reason I want to feel about that way about long form is there's only so much you can say in one panel cartoons. I want to say, I want to have a venue to say more things. I want to have a venue to record my memories and thoughts rather than just my feelings. Uh, she actually does post quite a lot on the Patreon, um, and I think you all should subscribe. If you don't know what Patreon is, it's like a you like chip in a couple bucks a month, and then you get access to Liana's um, cartoons, and they're really, really good. And it yeah, has the added too. benefit of there aren't you know thousands and thousands of people looking at every one. There's only your subscribers. Yeah. Does that make it feel different? Like. It's like okay. my dad and 15 other people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find it's more pressure because people are paying for it or it's less pressure because it's fewer people looking at it? It is. It's, it, I mostly feel like it's more pressure because I have to get to a scanner and I just abhor the scanner. I just hate it. <laughs> and it's a long story. I have two scanners. One of them does color and that is my less favorite scanner. <laughs> it's on my floor. I have to like change all these wires and dongles in order to use it. And it's, it's annoying. Uh, don't feel a ton of pressure. Feel some guilt that I'm not like yeah, I feel some guilt that people pay, and I'm not like giving them a thing every day. So far, I feel bad about it. Um, I subscribe to some people on Patreon, and um, I once. Yeah, you pay every every month. It's like it's not. I feel more comfortable chipping in ten dollars once than having a recurring monthly thing. It's a weird. I don't know why I feel weird about that, but I assume everyone else does too. Yes. And I post far less than you, so I feel more guilty. Um. I, I once like downgraded. I follow Gabrielle Bell, who you're amazing. Gabrielle Bell is amazing, and I like. She's a dear friend and a favorite comics artist. And I, um, I gave her five dollars a month for a year, and then I was like, why am I giving my friend five dollars a month? And I like downgraded her to two dollars. <laughs> And I didn't realize that she would notice, and she did. And she didn't tell me, but like, she noticed when I resubscribed to five later. <laughs> it's like this weird, so weird. It's not the social weirdness isn't worth the five dollars. It is very stressful. It's a weird you. company. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other but I'm not doing it for the money, so don't like. I don't care. <laughs> um, if you subscribe or not. I'm doing it to give myself a reason to experiment with long-form comics. Uh, there was a question there? I just have a really short, trivial question. I'm really curious about what your artist tools of choice are. Ooh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, Muji 0.38 gel pen. And I, <laughs> I draw on bright white staples printer paper. I'm sure other printer papers would be fine, but the Muji ugh, is kind of finicky about like a rough paper. It'll, the pen will just stop working if you write on just normal printer paper, so I try to get very smooth printer paper. It also doesn't do well with pencil, so I don't, um, I don't use pencil and then erase it because I would smudge the pen. Uh, I do use a light box now and then and I scan everything into my computer and then on Photoshop, I use Photoshop and a Wacom Cintiq tablet and I edit, I draw exclusively on paper and I edit on 
Photoshop with the Wacom Cintiq, which is a screen you can draw on that also, the, it's temperamental and kind of annoying, but it seems like the most direct way to me. And I scan 600 DPI, usually black and white. Just It's just, yeah. Um, when I use markers, I love mild liners. My agent, Meredith, uh, told me about them. Thanks. Sarah, Sarah has very good techniques. I think you should describe yours, too. I don't know. I, I'm a recent convert to Muji stuff, too. Lately, I've just been using those pens in the Muji sketchbooks, like the little ringed ones, because you don't have to care about them. Um, I really like those. I haven't. I had a baby a little while ago, so I haven't been doing a lot of serious work lately. But I don't know. I was listening to that long form podcast that you did. You said something that I, I can't remember verbatim right now, but it was about perfection and why trying to make perfect work um, is a terrible thing. Um, and it really stuck with me because I think that's what keeps me from working a lot of times is that I have an idea for a comic or for like a comics essay, um, but then I start thinking about it and trying to like make it just, just right, and then suddenly it's like, well, you can't do this properly, so it's better to not do it at all. Um, and you really made me rethink that, that like trying to make something perfect is actually just giving yourself an excuse to not do it, which I was like, that's true. I don't know. Um, I don't know how I got to talking about this, but yeah, thank you for that. Can you talk more about perfection? Yeah, I think I think perfectionism is the same as shyness. I think when I was a kid, I didn't want to talk in case the thing I said was somehow wrong or offensive or boring or anything. And and like finally, I learned how to make conversation. And the secret to conversation is that it doesn't have to be anything. It just like the whole point of it is that it just keeps coming out. And I th I try to do that with drawing too. And it's it's a I think I hobble myself a little bit. Like my Instagrams are so grody, and I photograph them and don't scan them. And I think I'm afraid that if I ever tried to add detail, I would fall into this black hole of perfectionism again. And as I get older, I find that the um, I have like a, a I'm allowed to add more detail before I fall into that hole. It's it's kind of alleviating. I'm getting less shy. Do you want to talk at all about Passing for Human and how your process was different with that book? Because there is a ton of detail. And I don't know, it looks like it was a lot of fun to draw, was it? Passing for Human was a lot of fun to draw. It was, I was trying to be simple. I think I started Passing for Human and then I started my Instagram feed. And the, the Instagram really did inform Passing for Human. Like I did these kind of simple line drawings each box was a square, a two inch square, like there was no v variation in box size, which was a revelation for me that you don't have to do page design in a way to do comics. You could just focus on each box at once, at one at a time. Um, the thing that took a lot of time with Passing for Human is that I decided as a stunt to do all the blacks um, shaded in with this tiny pen. And it was a statement about women's work because it's a book about being a woman and an artist. and. It was also the title, the, the original title was The Shadow, so it also had, it was a statement about shadows, that they're alive. Uh, and I, yeah, I got Carpal Tunnel, and I did a million drafts of that book. I, 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 I learned a way to edit comics, which is to draw each page simply, but then to kind of trace each page like a hundred times and change the detail, ev the details every time. And I have trouble making a page unless I think it's the final page. So I colored in most of those drafts, and it was such like, like you can draw a page in ten minutes, and then it'll take you the next four hours to shade it in. It was such a waste of time, and I didn't enjoy that part. This was also with the Muji pen? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, I think they have her Passing for Human here, too. It's a memoir, and it's very good. Thank you. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, there's one over there. Has anyone in the... Does it work? Has anyone in the comment section ever changed your mind about something? Oh, yeah. All the time. Um, sometimes... T I once got a lot of people who identified as sociopaths really angry at me <laughs> for calling Trump 
a sociopath, just kind of in like a whimsical way, but they were so mad. They were like, I identify as a sociopath and you're a real bucket of shit. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess you are, have diagnosed yourself correctly. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I haven't used the word sociopath since then. I didn't realize it was a real term. I thought it was just like a, like a nimrod or something. <laughs> um, yeah, and other things too, of course, like I think gender has, the, I, the way we think about gen, the way people who are cisgendered and haven't been forced to think about gender has changed so much since I started the Instagram like five years ago. Like I thought of it as men versus women and sometimes people are gay and, um, I, yeah, that I think about it very differently now, and I think I draw accordingly, and it keeps changing accordingly. And it, interesting that as long as I don't get canceled, I'm glad to have a record of the way my thinking has changed. Oh, there's one. We got time for a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, I actually saw you speak about passing for human at, at Greenlight, and I think we were talking about your style, and you were like, oh, that's just my style for this decade. It might change. Yeah. They have license <laughs> to change. Um, but I think particularly given that you have like such a distinctive one now, and also that you were like going back over five years on your Instagram looking at your stuff, have you noticed how it's changed in those five years as you were like looking back at it? The style, I'm not, yes, I think... Mm. Yeah, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. I think uh I think I've gotten more confident and the good thing the good thing about getting more confident is that you pay more attention to the page. It's kind of like you're able to take a step back more. And so I think I've become a better designer and I have like a little more flair in my handwriting and stuff. And I also try a little harder to make the photographs like not have huge shadows in them and stuff. But the way I've gotten worse is I think sometimes I copy, I um, plagiarize myself. Like it is, like sometimes, I, another reason I started the Patreon is I was just, getting bored of having this persona that I have to fill all the time and I felt like I was phoning it in for a bit. It, but it comes in waves, you phone it in and then you stop phoning it in. Are you a really good speller? Or do Great. you? Great. Yeah, because. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have typos all the time. Oh, and do people point them out to you? Probably, I, yeah, I'm not a good speller. But you're a really good letterer. Thank you. Yeah, I my, envy a lot. my mom was an architect, and she has <gasps> the. She's now an artist, but right. she retains the handwriting of the architect. Did you learn from copying her lettering when you were little? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my signature is also learned from forging her signature on my first grade <laughs> weekly Parshat Hashavua reports, which is a Jewish <laughs> thing. Are <laughs> Um, I'm curious, I feel like a lot of your work is really vulnerable, which is what is so great about it. I'm curious if you ever get like a vulnerability hangover or you know, how that plays out for you. I get a lot of vulnerability hangover for ever talking about neurodiversity. I hate what it does to my friendships and I, yeah. Um, romance, when I was dating, what, it was weird to have spilled so much of my heart. Some people would go on a date with me on Tinder because they had heard of me and they wanted to like be in a story or, or just like spy on me and they had no interest in actually dating an oversharer. They just wanted to see me once and that was very hurtful. Uh, what else? Yeah, sometimes I think the other day I did a man spreader. I drew a diagram of a man spreader, and then I did it after the person I was sitting next to got off the train. But then a new man got on and sat next to me, kind of looked over, and then he's just like, and then he's like <laughs> looking at me and like going like that, and then he's like, nice drawing. So <laughs> I guess that was a vulnerability hangover in a very literal sense. I wanted to ask. Um, 
sometimes I find it hard to draw in public because I get really shy. I don't want people looking at what I'm drawing. Like, mm -hmm. how do you handle that? Because people must come and look at your stuff all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just so and real. ask you about it. I'm so mean. I'm just really mean. It works. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you lessons. Yeah, this one guy, um, I looked at his dog. I look at dogs, and he brought his dog into the cafe, and... I gave the dog the, gra the graciousness of looking at it. And then he, as he left, he looked at me as if you're allowed to do that to a woman and was like, whatever you're doing, good luck. And I just, I've never, he comes in every day. I sit there every day. I haven't looked at his dog once since then. And I have taught him his lesson. <laughs> you punished him by not looking at his dog. Yeah. I think that's the worst punishment a dog owner can have. Yeah, I agree. Someone ignoring their dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do we have a final question in the questions? audience? Right back here. All right, hi. Um, I'll start with, i was been wondering this since like I started following you like three or four years ago because my ex-boyfriend actually introduced me to your like cartoons and was like, this is you. Like, <laughs> like all the, like, the pictures. And then like I, I don't, can't remember which one. It was like a lion one, I think, or something. And it was like, someone talking at a girl or something. And then I looked at it, I was like, wow, what? Like, and I guess I'm just wondering, obviously I broke up with him, but I'm wondering like, for any of your partners or anything who have gotten like upset at you, you were saying, when you like write things about them, like has anyone ever exhibited any sense of like self-awareness or like apology or has been more like, oh, I'm gonna fight about like, you wrote this about me, like why did you do that? Um, never an apology. And I think if I ever got one, I would have to stop drawing them. My lovely, dear, wonderful boyfriend now is an artist as well, and he's really just gives me my space with them, and I think that's what I want. And I, yeah, I hope he knows that if I write about him, it's more about a thing that I notice about relationships and want to piece out for myself rather than like recording gritty details um but it, yeah it it's complicated uh. <laughs> okay can we get a round of applause for liana and sarah <laughs>